Hey, Sheldon Dingwall here. How would you like to win an NG bass or a Dark Plus paddle or a license for Get Good Drums? I'll tell you what, we have a contest here. We've teamed up with those two companies and check it out. Here's your chance to jam with Adam Nolly Get Good. So throw a bass riff over top of that, send it in to us, and you could win. All right, so send in your bass riffs, and good luck, everybody. Hey, everybody, we are live at uh, Dingwall headquarters here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, my name is Sheldon Dingwall, and... Um, yeah, um, welcome. Glad you could make it out. Uh, if you're like me, uh, you've seen a lot of personal growth through this COVID period. Uh, in my case, uh, the growth has been hair, beard, and waistline. Uh, unfortunately, it's limited to that, but uh, uh, there's still time yet. Maybe I can improve some other areas of my life. To start off with, we get a lot of questions about um, the differences between our higher level instruments, the Zs, and the Afterburner series. And um, right off the bat, uh, the necks were designed differently. The Zs came from the very first bass that was designed way back in, our first bass that was designed way back in 1992-93. Um, and so you'll notice that the edges of the neck are parallel to the taper of the string. So the neck is very compact um, and it's also in depth, it's also one millimeter uh, thinner along the uh, the length of the neck, and uh, same nut width, but a narrower heel and um, and a thinner profile front to back, and so that makes for a very sleek feeling instrument. The afterburners and the supers follow more of um, what what we saw with Fender, and that was where um, the heel is actually wider than than. Um, uh, the taper is wider at the heel than the taper of the strings. I'm not really sure why um, Fender did that, but it's not a bad idea. It gives you a little bit more room to um, to be sloppy in the upper frets. Um, but if you want the most compact neck possible that we make, um, the Z is your is your baby. And in this particular Z, this is a Lee Sklar model, and um, so it uses mandolin frets. And I'm going to just hold that up closer so you can see the size of those frets. Look at how small those are. They're, they're absolutely tiny. Um, and um, the advantage of that is that you're hearing less metal in the tone and more wood. And that makes sense if you think about it. There's less metal in the fret. And, and uh, so correspondingly, um, the balance of tone is, is weighted more to the wood side. And it's a really nice organic tone if, if that's what you're looking for. Um, you would think that the frets would wear out quickly, but they don't. Um, all frets, uh, especially all nickel silver frets, um, suffer from an early wear that's that's actually not metal removal, but it's metal displacement. And so you'll get grooves on the tops of the frets. Uh, they'll be more noticeable on the angled frets, less noticeable on on the perpendicular frets. Um, but that's that's normal with every single bass um, and. Uh, and it's just more noticeable with multi-scale instruments or fad fret instruments. Um, but these uh, frets, they last for a very, very long time, uh, depending on how hard you play and whether you're using nickel strings or stainless. Uh, nickel strings are easier on frets and you could expect five to 10 years out of, out of a set of tiny little mandolin frets. It's unbelievable, but uh, that's what we've seen so far from the people that have uh, had them on their bases. Um, one of the other interesting things about the Sklar is that um, the body is, is not just dual density, which we do on all disease, but it's actually dual species. So um, this half of the, of the base body and up is northern swamp ash, very hard, dense wood, gives you an incredible uh, B-string clarity. And then from the middle point down is alder. And so that's a very common wood, and it's it's warmer sounding, um, and it warms up the trebles on the sklar. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get that that sharp, 
clear, bright attack on the, on the bass strings and it warms up and damps the highs on the uh, treble strings. And um, so uh, uh, it's very interesting. I don't have a demo set up, but uh, at some point we will. Um, but if you took the strings off of the Sklar and you plugged it into an amp, and you just tapped on the saddles with something metallic or maybe a, um, something that would just give a, a, a bit of a resonance, um, you can actually hear the difference as you go from um, saddle to saddle to saddle. You can hear the, the difference in tone change as you go across the body. It's really something uh, cool. You hear more resonance and warmth on the treble side and brighter and snappier on the bass side. Um, we have a question here from Matt Parker. Hi, Sheldon and team. I have an original run Combustion 5, but would love to try Super J. Are we going to see an import Super J? Um, well, that's a good question, Matt. Uh, if we get enough demand, sure, um, we'll work on an import Super J. Um, that's not something that we have in the cards right now. It's not something we're developing right now, but we are working on models um, behind the scenes. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, typically I'm working three to five years out. So anything I'm working on right now, you won't see for three to five years. Um, and uh, that's just because the incubation period, um, well, heck, I mean, the incubation period on, on some bases like the G-Rock were almost a decade in development. Um, and not quite that long before people saw them, but a decade before we had what we have now. So... Um, uh, I can't promise you that we have a Super J import on the way, uh, but I can promise you that we have some very cool new imports on the way and that uh, we'll announce them as soon as we feel comfortable that, that we have them developed as far as we can and that the supply is, is uh, readily available. Thanks for the question, Matt. Um, Dennis, how can you uh, set up a C string to be not so close to the fingerboard edge. I have a Prima six, six, six string. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, but the problem that you'll run into if you try and tighten up the bridge spacing is that that will mess with the, um, with the uh, intonation. So my recommendation would be there's a little bit of play um, in the pocket that the bridge is routed into. And the reason for that is to allow for the wood to expand and contract. And so you need to leave a little bit of room for it to contract uh, in the wintertime when it's dry. Otherwise, you could end up with uh, cracks because you're trying to squeeze a hard bridge with soft wood. Um, so one of the things you could try is to go into the back and loosen up your bridge ever so slightly and see if there's, you, I would recommend uh, lo loosening the strings or taking the strings off. See if there's any way that you can slide the bridge um, towards the base side and then lock it into place with the screws. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can, um, again, uh, to allow for expansion and contraction, um, the neck pocket is going to be tight, but it's not going to be so tight that if you loosened off the uh, screws ever so slightly and then uh, push the neck a little bit in this direction, um, just to change the centerline axis, and uh, just a little bit, like a, a few thousandths of an inch of, of rotation in the neck pocket will give you uh, a noticeable amount of room on the uh, C-string on the treble side. Um, so those are my two recommendations. Try and rotate the neck slightly and try and move the bridge slightly. Um, and uh, Danis is saying that this is probably one of the first Primas. Cool, man. Uh, you should send a photo to... Um, to us, uh, you could send it via PM on Facebook, and and would love to see it. And send a photo with you in the photo, because we'd love to see you with your base too. Uh, Bobby Fernandez, hey Bobby, how you doing? Um, how long does it take to get from start to finish on a custom built dingwall? Um, okay, so that's a good question. It really depends on on uh, how complex the build is. Uh, a custom afterburner or a, a custom ABZ. Um, would let's say roughly 50 hours, uh, but let's say a prima artist could be double that. And, um, and if we add things that we've never done before, well, sometimes we'll actually build an entire base just to test something out before we commit to, um, let's say a prima artist. Uh, we've done that several times as we evolve our tooling, 
uh, things change and and uh, if we haven't built a Prima Artist in a, in a little while then we will actually build um, a demo Prima Artist it, like we will never be sold and hang out as a shop base just for us to uh, test things on but we'll build an entire base just to make sure that we got everything down. Um, Chris, hey Chris, how you doing? Uh, thanks for the super P, unbelievable base. Well, thank you, man, and, and you've been posting like crazy today. That's awesome to see. Really glad you're happy with it. Um, you're you're an awesome player, an awesome guy, and and uh, you know it, it's one of the the greatest things uh, about this industry, about about base building and guitar building, is just the fact that that uh, it's a really personal it's a personal thing. You know, it's not just a product. It's we, we put our blood, sweat, and tears into this, and then and then it goes to people that we really like, and then they enjoy uh, our work, and then they add their work to it, and and then they take that to our to their audience, and and so just the whole business is just something that uh, is super cool. Love it. This is Danny Sweet. He's you send us a picture. Uh, Dennis, okay, I recognize this bass, and you were saying it was probably one of the first Prima artists. And as a matter of fact, yes, it's the very first Prima artist. It's not the first Prima. We were doing Primas as of 1994, I believe. Um, but that is the very first Prima artist. And the original customer had a, had a huge hand in kind of pushing me to, to uh, try new things out. So that's the very first uh, uh, Dingwall base with matching pickup covers. And the way we do it is we actually cut the top of the pickup um, out of the top before we glue it together. And with a Prima Artist, you're talking a top and a contrast layer and then the core and then another contrast layer and then the back. So uh, that's a lot of pieces of wood to keep track of when you're cutting uh, pieces of wood out of them. And, and um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a, we take it very slow and we pace ourselves so that we don't do something stupid like accidentally glue a piece of wood upside down, which would be impossible to recover from. <laughs> so glad you're enjoying that bass. Um, it's an awesome bass and uh, I, I remember very well um, way back in the day building that bass and it was it was a fun project. Um, Francis uh, Lim, how are you? Um, do you have a purple swirl color NG3 six string but matte finish or purple matte finish? Ooh, wouldn't that be cool? Um, no, we don't. But man, uh, I would love to see um, that uh, Mopar purple in a matte finish. Um, I think it would be a perfect finish to, uh, to uh, perfect color for matte. Um, you know what? I'm going to log that in the, to try out in the future. And uh, who knows? You, you may see it. And if I forget to give you credit, be sure to let me know so we can give you credit for the idea. Um, Ruben, how are you doing, man? Uh, will you be moving any production out of China? How about moving it to Korea or Taiwan? Um, you know, I don't know of any guitar manufacturing in Taiwan. I'm not saying that there isn't any, but uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any factories there. Um, we have been working with a factory in Korea for a year and a half. Um, the production is not rolling out yet, but it is very close. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, at a couple of other countries. Um, not that we're dissatisfied with the production in China, as a matter of fact, um, the quality that we're getting on the NGs and D-Rock four strings and combustions is phenomenal. It is, um, compared to any other bass that, that, that I've inspected now, I haven't inspected everybody's bass from China, obviously, but um, compared to what you would expect, um, the quality is amazing. And, and we're very proud of the bases that we've got coming out of China. So we won't change production locations for the NGs, Combustions, and, and DROC 4s. Um, those are doing great, and, and um, uh, but we are looking at other areas of, of manufacturing for various reasons. Um, uh, it, it's a big world out there, and, and um, sometimes you need to not have all your eggs in one basket. Um, okay, uh, I'm missing this comment here, Felipe. Can you can you pull that up for me, please? Uh, Matt Parker. Um, in the case I eagerly await some of the new import range, uh, my second question, if I'm allowed to be greedy, and yes, you are, um, 
is how do I uh, further get involved with Dingwall moving forward for a shell pink combustion six with no pick guard? Uh, that's a good question. Um, no plans for shell pink. That would be cool though, wouldn't it? Um, especially if it was matte shell pink, I think that would be pretty awesome. Um, we are looking at, at doing pick guard deletes on combustion threes. Um, it's not official yet, but at some point in the future, uh, it is a possibility. Uh, it would have to be a, a 3X, not a, um, a C1, because the bodies are pre-routed for three pickups. Whether you get one, two, or three pickups, uh, it will always have holes for three. So that's the only way we can do a, a pick guard delete is if it's on a three pickup base. Um, shell pink, no plans for it yet, but um, I can recommend uh, a couple of finishers in, in the United States. If you're, if you're from the United States, I can re recommend a couple of finishers. Um, there's Fausa Shop, there's Roxy, um, there's uh, Pat Wilkins, all do amazing finishes and they can, Shell Pink would be no problem for them. Um, and uh, they're not, it's not crazy expensive. It's, uh, it's crazy expensive to have us refinish a, a guitar for you because we're not set up to do custom finishes. But for those guys, um, I'm surprised at how reasonable their finishes are. Um, Richard, two products that would possibly drain my bank account in the future besides my Z two years out is a headless guitar and uh, our take on EBMM Stingray 5 body type. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we don't have plans for guitars right at this moment, although we do have designs um, on the drawing board. And like I say, uh, stuff that I'm working on design-wise now could be three years, could be five years, um, or, or the project could completely tank if, if, if we miss the wave. Um, are loosely planning a headless bass, but not a guitar at this moment. Um, were you thinking six string guitar or seven or eight? Um, uh, let me know in the comments below. I'd, I'd love to know what you're, what you're interested in. Um, and what was the second one? It was a, a Music Man Stingray 5 body type. I'd have to look into that. Um, um, Ernie Ball tend to um, uh, trademark a lot of their design ideas. And, um, and good for them. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, if, if their body shape is trademarked, would, would not touch it. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we do get very close to a Stingray tone in both the NG2 and the Sklar. And uh, so we have the tone options available, um, just we don't have the body options at this point. Um, Mike, I'm super happy with the fit and finish of my new NG3 top-notch setup too. Well, thanks very much, Mike. Um, as you know, the, the NG3 was manufactured in China, but it came to us and then we did all the fret work here. We did the nut work. Um, we went through the electronics and did the setup and, and made sure that it was um, something that we would want to play before it left the shop. So I'm glad you appreciate uh, all the work that the guys have been doing here. Uh, we've got an excellent team of guys and, um, and they love what they're doing and we love, love having them here working on um, the NGs. As a matter of fact, uh, anybody who's um, interested in, in business models, um, often when you think of outsourcing, you think of jobs disappearing from, from one location and going to someplace else. And that's absolutely not the case with Dingwall. We've actually been able to hire more people, uh, have more people in our local um, uh, economy working because of outsourcing, because we do this, this uh, two-tiered uh, business model where we source from uh, from Asia and then do the final setup and finish on um, in our shop. So it's worked out really well. It's It's been able to uh, allow us to grow and it's been able to allow us to hire more people and and, uh, and uh, I think that's a good thing. I, I really like the way it's working out. Uh, Arlington, how are you doing, man? Uh, are there any... Sorry, it's gonna take me a second and I, we gotta find your uh, question that... again. Are there any graphite bars in the neck of my 2009 C3X? Yes, there are. There are two. And um, I think you'll notice that that uh, if you compare pre-graphite and post-graphite, that you hear um, a little bit more high frequencies. The harmonics um, are more present. And uh, if that's part of your tone, um, then uh, you'll very much appreciate it. 
Um, Stability-wise, uh, maybe they're a little bit better, um, not hugely better because we've always used laminated necks on the combustion, so the necks have always been very stable. Um, but the graphite is a nice addition and it really does help those uh, harmonics to pop and, and uh, give a snappy response. Um, Johan, uh, is it possible to rewire the three pickup combustion and NGs uh, to position three being bridge and neck in series instead of parallel? Um, it's totally possible to do that, but you would have to start from scratch. You'd have to start with um, a bare rotary switch and then do point-to-point -point wiring um, and have a technician figure out what those what, what the wiring would need to be. We don't have a, a wiring diagram or a schematic for it. Um, but it's not rocket science. It's a rotary switch. Um, a, a really good electronics tech should be able to figure that out in you know an hour of, of um, head scratching time and then be able to wire it in probably another hour. Um, uh, so as it is from us, no, that's not possible. However, um, if you're comparing uh, an older NG2 with a newer NG3, what we did with the, um, the older NG2s was we wired the pickups, the coils inside the pickups internally in uh, parallel. And then when you wired the two pickups in series with each other, you get almost the exact same tone as we get now, which is we have the pickups internally wired in series and then um, and then on the rotary they're uh, wired in, in parallel with each other. Um, so you get almost the same tone um, and uh, hopefully hopefully that helps you out. Um, and Richard you uh, you mentioned um, you corrected that uh, you're looking for a headless base so yeah it's, um, that's not something that I can promise uh, a timeline on, but it is something that we're working on. The holdup for me is is hardware. Um, uh, because we use such an extended scale, I like things to be really compact. And the, there are some great headless bridges out there. There just isn't anything that, that I would consider compact enough for, for what I have envisioned and uh, multi-scale compatible. So uh, that's something that I've been working on. And uh, who knows? I may have to um, may have to uh, license some technology from some other designers to make it work, uh, but maybe not. I've got I've got a couple of options that we're going to try out first. Um, uh, Jacob Masky, hey Jacob, how you doing, man? Um, everybody, uh, I'm sure is aware of of Jacob and his his amazing playing. Super happy to have him on the team. What a great guy! What a great uh, musician! Um, and just a fun guy to hang out with, too. Um, so Jacob's saying, so remember when Dingwall posted a status asking what colors they should make the D-Rock custom? And I said, Matt Green. Any chance the base behind you is the result of that, or is that just a coincidence? Uh, hope all is well. Well, let's take a look at this base here. Do you want to put that one away? Um, so how's that for a Matt Green color? This is a Matt Pearl Green. It's not really showing up in... In, um, in this camera as being at all sort of uh, metallic-y, but it is. And so not only is it uh, kind of a matte military green, but it, under lighting, it, it kind of glows a little bit. So it's a really cool finish. And uh, it goes really well with, with the uh, Wenge Picard. Um, and uh, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna give you the credit, Jacob. Uh, we'll call this Jacob Green. And uh, David, uh, thanks for uh, checking in. Love, love, love my Dingwall, best instrument I've ever played ever. Well, awesome, Dave. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate that you like what we do, and and um, and we hope that uh, your audience appreciates the music that you play on it. And and even if you don't play live, um, especially nobody's playing live that much these days. Um, just the I hope that you have um, just. A special feeling of enjoyment every time you pick the bass up. I hope it inspires you and and, uh, and takes you to places where there's music that you didn't know you even had in you. Um, that would be awesome. Um, Harland, would you make a seven string bass? Just wondering. Um, at this point, Harland, no, we just don't see enough demand for it. And uh, the, the tooling for a multi scale instrument, holy cow, um, it is a challenge. And um, so Unless we think that there's going to be a substantial market for it, um, uh, it, it's just not something we can afford to do. 
Now, that being said, um, if you're building, you know, there are lots of luthiers out there that, um, that uh, hand build instruments and they are experienced with multi-scale. Guys like that, it's, the, their tooling requirements are not as intense as somebody with a, a CNC machine. So um, a seven string multi-scale bass, bad fret bass, uh, I would recommend going to somebody like Martin Keith or um, uh, Martin's the first guy to come to my mind, but there are other guys out there as well. Um, and uh, for them, it's it's uh, much more approachable uh, to tackle something like that. That would be an amazing base, though. I, uh, if, if you want one, I would recommend giving it a try. Uh, Tyler Wood, um, purely a question about your preferences. Who do you think is the most inventive Dingwall player out there these days? Um, gosh, you know what? Uh, I like them all for different reasons. Uh, Jacob, of course, who was just on here is amazingly inventive and uh, just an incredible, just all around musician, you know. Um, uh, he's, he's gifted in so many areas that I can't pick any one out that he's, he's strong in because he's strong in them all. Uh, Ayumu is, is amazing. Um, uh, Claudio Rocha is amazing. Uh, I, I think pretty much all of our, all of our uh, artists are amazing in their own ways, and um, so I wouldn't want to single out any single one. Uh, I've mentioned three just off the top of my head, but man, there's so many more, and, and we really appreciate all the uh, excuse me all the contributions. Um, but uh, appreciate the question. Yeah, thank you, um, Matt Parker. Uh, we know that you take inspiration from the automotive uh, industry for finishes, uh, which other non-related industries inspire you in terms of design? Um, mountain bikes, um, motorcycles, uh, cars, obviously. And, um, you know, there used to be, it used to be popular on uh, the Discovery Channel to have, let's say, some sort of chopper builder that that make something that was influenced by, I don't know, a guitar company, and then you'd end up with microphones as hand grips. That's not really our thing. Um, that's cool, but it's not really our thing. We draw influences from cars and motorcycles and mountain bikes, um, but and you wouldn't really you wouldn't really recognize the influences in the uh, in the bases themselves, but they're there um, in the shapes and the curves, um, in the colors and um, uh, those would be the three main ones, but you know, uh, every now and again, I'll go and I'll, I'll walk through a sporting goods store and I'll take a look at, at, um, skateboards and, um, snowboards and skis. And all of these companies have young, cool designers doing their graphics. And, and, uh, I love the enthusiasm that I see on these products. It's, uh, uh, it's really cool. I'd love to do that in a base, but, uh, bases, you know, aren't as disposable as, as sports equipment is. So we have to be a little bit more conservative on the finishes. Um, Rick Gauthier, uh, I second that. He's a fun guy to hang out with. Um, talking about Jacob, of course. Um, Christopher Downey, ever thought about a Lucite body? Uh, yes, and Mark Lumpkin will also um, uh, chime in if he's around. Um, problem with Lucite is just the weight of it. And so... Um, uh, I don't know why, but I, I just, you know, medium weight is, is really high in my values. Um, when I was a live musician, I had guitars that were too light and they just seemed to be flying all over the place. And I had them, some that were so heavy that they were just kind of a drag to play. Um, so if we were to do a Lucite body, I'd have to put a lot of thought into how we could lighten it up um, and, uh, and still have it look nice and transparent. I think it'd be super cool. Uh, it's just a project that I uh, haven't had time to sink enough time into uh, making it work to how I'd like to see it. Um, uh, Christian Sturgis. Hey, Christian, how you doing, man? Uh, speaking of guys, uh, artists that have a lot of talent that, uh, that we love their playing, there's Christian. Um, and uh, he's, he's uh, sending a greeting, hoping, hoping that uh, the family and uh, the team are well. And thank you, sir, and I appreciate that. I hope everyone in your in your uh, circle is uh, doing well as well. Um, crazy times we're in, we're gonna get through it, but uh, uh, the craziness is, is just something we have to deal with. And uh, um, Johan Martin, uh, 
how much would the pricing be affected if the combustions and NGs had lumen lay side dots? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't have that answer for you, but uh, I suspect, you know, it would probably add, you know, maybe as much as $100 um, to, uh, to the end cost. Um, and uh, I would hope it wouldn't be that much. You know, maybe we'd get a volume discount, but uh, uh, lumen lay are made by a small company. And, um, and their cost of doing business is quite high, at least on the manufacturing side. But uh, I, I think that's something I should look into. I think that'd be pretty cool. So thanks for the idea. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look into it further. Uh, Eskil is asking, can you explain on what the dark glass tone capsule does to the base tone with all the EQ bands neutral? It seems like magic to me. Um, so uh, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not an electrical tech. Um, what I can tell you is that the with the control set flat, um, the dark glass does um, uh, buffer the signal, and it does change um, the the tone slightly. And I believe that's just due to the fact it probably has a, a very high uh, input impedance, and so it's like it's like taking your guitar chord and just making it the shortest guitar chord possible. Um, and so that you're not loading down the, the passive pickups with, um, with a lot of, uh, of uh, capacitance and uh, possibly resistance. But uh, that's about all I can tell you. Uh, it's relatively flat, but it does, you, you hear a noticeable bump in the highs and, and, uh, and a little bit of uh, output bump as well. And to tell you the truth, um, I really like that tone too. So um, it's kind of neat being able to go back and forth between active and passive, even if you don't use the controls because it does alter the tone of your bass. Um, Eric, uh, I just got my Indigo Burst Combustion from Bass Club Chicago last week. Awesome, thank you. Uh, terrific, excellent killer. Um, NG Bass, love it. Well, thanks, Eric, and uh, super glad that, uh, that you're enjoying the bass. And are you a Chicago native, or uh, did you did you have that uh, shipped out to you? Um, be interested to know that. Um, Chicago is Chicago is a really cool town in, in terms of guitar because um, uh, in the early days of of U.S. guitar manufacturing, it, it mostly started in New York, and as new, the the cost of doing business in New York got too expensive, guitar production shifted over to Chicago. So Chicago is. It has a deep history with guitar manufacturing, with harmony, um, and uh, uh, I've always wanted to go there. That's that's on my bucket list. Um, I'd love to see your beautiful city. Um, and uh, David, uh, hi Sheldon, could you speak about your serial number system and how they relate to the different models, both custom and standard, their data manufacturer, etc. Man, I wish I had a really good system that I could amaze you with, but uh, the fact of the matter is is that back when we first started our serial numbers, we just, uh, the, the, the com because I'd started the company building guitar necks and only guitar necks, uh, I didn't want any confusion between guitar necks and uh, basses, so I started the bass serial numbers at 1,000. And uh, we've just gone sequentially ever since. There is no relation to, um, to uh, date of birth or date of build. Um, it's just a sequential number. We used to number the bases after they were completed. Uh, now we're numbering the bases as they're ordered. So um, uh, essentially, um, in the early days, as, the, as you looked at the serial numbers, you could tell when they were shipped in relation to each other, but now that's not so clear. Um, it's just a number for keeping track internally and, and doesn't really help you much as far as dating your instrument. Um, and uh, uh, Rick, uh, take care. I'm glad to see you take part and, and take care of your family, my friend. Uh, Hal Shrink. Um, hi, old friend. From a drummer's perspective, I enjoy the tone and consistent sound of the Dingwalls. It really shines in an ear, in ear mix, especially the five string models. I know you've built guitars. Have you ever considered building other instruments like drums? Uh, you've got all the woods. Um, as a matter of fact, Hal, uh, I have built drums, um, and uh, uh, it's one of those things where, man, um, the people that are building drums now, like Ron Dunnett and and um, all the all the drum nerds out there, 
man, they're working at such a high level. Um, I would love to be able to add something to that, but man, I'd have to stop what I'm doing and, and just figure out how, figure out how I could uh, design a drum that that nobody else had done and that it, it sounds different and it's enjoyable to play. Um, got a couple of ideas. I should run them past you sometime and see what you think. Um, and Hal is uh, is is a good friend, and he's also the guy that does a lot of our graphics, and so a lot of what you see at Dingwall uh, has had Hal's um, uh, fingerprints on it. Uh, amazing graphic artist, uh, an incredible drummer, and um, and so I appreciate the question. Uh, he also brings up a point too, and and this is not the first time that we've heard it. Um, uh, there are a lot of advantages to the multi-scale system and that we've noticed over the years. And, it, and it's not that we noticed them so much as we got the feedback from people. And, and one of the things is that drummers really appreciate, uh, especially the long scale um, on, on the uh, lower strings because they can hear it more clearly. And if you think about it, if you're trying to play tightly with a drummer, it's an interactive thing. You're not so much just playing to the drummer, but he's also playing to you. So if, if he can hear the bass better, he's able to lock in with you better and you're able to lock in with him better and it's just just a better relationship um so that's one of the hidden advantages of multi-scale it's not just about ergonomics or tone or this or that it's it's uh, how it interacts in this uh this this ecosphere of the band and uh, also we get feedback from singers as well they can read pitch off the bass uh, much better because of that extended scale length and the transparency and the clarity of the note. So um, it's not just about the bass, it's about how it fits in with the rest of the mix and the rest of the musicians. Uh, Joe, I always love in, love listening to you talk about what you do. Thank you, Joe. Um, your genuine passion is inspiring. Um, I've got a gorgeous Whirlpool Burst ABZ5 that I use for almost everything. I've recently been trying my hand at rebuilding and repainting finishing bases. Uh, never my dingwall, of course. Thank you. Um, it's perfect. Do you have any advice for aspiring builders? Uh, thanks for all you do. Um, yeah, Joe, that's... Um, finishing is, man, that's probably the hardest thing that that there is to uh, to do and to learn how to do well. Um, and the reason is, is that um, guitar finishes... Man, they're like no other finish in the world. Uh, the, the finish that we use is custom manufactured for guitars. Um, it's not made for cars. It's not made for um, boardroom tables. It's made for guitars um, because guitars have to do things that, that interior furniture never has to. You know, you, you, you don't throw your, your table or your cabinet into the back of your car and drive to a gig and, at, in 40 below and, and you're not rubbing it with jean rivets and you're not sweating all over your TV stand and so on and so forth. Um, and cars aren't made out of wood. So uh, all these finishes have different qualities to them. What I would recommend is I would start out by getting some books and videos from Stuart McDonald. Um, they are like the number one source for guitar building supplies and information. And I would start there. And then the next thing is what I would recommend is if you're going to practice um, on, a, on a used guitar, and you want to try uh, doing a new finish, uh, leave the old finish on, um, scuff it up, and spray over it. Um, the sealer is the toughest thing because uh, the sealer soaks into the wood, and uh, if it's a slow-drying finish, it will soak in forever, and then you'll have to keep um, adding more layers and layers, and the finish is going to build in thickness, and then you got to sand it back. Um, it's, it's a real challenge. So if you can just eliminate the sealer uh, portion by saving the finish that's already on the guitar, I would do that. Um, and of course that only applies for solid finishes, but hey, solid finishes are a good place to start. Um, Bobby, always enjoy hearing you talk. Thank you, my friend, for doing all the love content. Well, thank you, Bobby. I appreciate you uh, taking part and appreciate everything you do. And man, you've got a great personality. And you're a super fun guy and, and an awesome bass player as well. Um, Justin, uh, hi Sheldon, any idea how many D-Bird five strings um, were made? And how long till we can see some Hellboys appearing? Okay, those are two really good questions. Off the top of my head, um, I think there were possibly only two D-Bird five strings. Um, I think they were both NAM samples, and uh, and then that was it. And um, 
So uh, there's, man, I, I don't even know if any of them are permanently out in the field. I think one of them is, and, and the rest we have here, and, and they, they just won't be released. Um, now, as far as the Hellboy goes, uh, we're working very hard on the Hellboy, and um, we actually, uh, I can't show you this at this moment, but we actually changed the body shape a little bit to make the graphics easier to, um, and, and more reliable. And so that was a bit of a holdup, and, uh, and of course this is a new process for us, so uh, what worked in the prototype stage, um, uh, we had to relearn things in the production stage. So they will be out soon. Um, the uh, the uh, work is being worked on them right now as we speak. Uh, I just can't give you an exact date when you'll see them, but uh, it will be soon. Um, and Eric says, uh, Chicago native and uh, Cubs fan. Right on. Well, hope to meet you someday, Eric. And and uh, like I said, love to see your beautiful city and and uh, what a what a great what a great amount of history. Um, I'm a fan of skyscrapers and architecture, and Chicago, of course, is the birthplace of the sky skyscrapers. So, um, uh, I'd love to uh, just hang out in your city. Um, Johan, are the neck, middle, and bridge pickups voiced differently, or are they the same? Um, that's a good question. So, I assume you're speaking of the NG3 or the Combustion 3. Um, the pickups are identical. However, um, what we've done is we've started. Um, wiring the middle pickup in, uh, oh man, you know what, I have to go back and ask my tech, but I believe it's the middle pickup is wired in parallel, and uh, the reason for that is with the rotary switch, um, with a passive system, when you start combining different pickups, they add or they slightly subtract, subtract from the volume settings, and so you'll notice the rotary switch, all four settings have slightly different volumes. And so um, we've been playing with um, internally wiring one or two of the pickups in parallel to try and balance out that output a little bit. So to answer your question, they're identical. They may not be wired identical, but uh, if you wanted, you could go in and you could rewire them in either series or parallel to suit your taste. Uh, Mateus. Um, hi. Cheaper production models incoming, or what are Dingwall's views on the topic? Um, yeah, uh, we are looking at, at uh, uh, doing some more, opening up our, our uh, import production. And to, it's not so much to provide a cheaper uh, option, it's, it's to provide an option that more people can afford. Um, you know, uh, not everybody um, lives in, 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 a, in, a, in an economy that can afford a $2,000 bass guitar. And uh, not everybody has a job that supports that. Um, and so uh, we definitely have our eyes on um, offering something that, that will be of a quality that, that, um, that we're proud of. And, that, and by that, I mean, you can take this base and you could tour the world with it. And that was the goal with the combustion. And many people do tour the world with combustions. Uh, and that is our goal with, with whatever we bring out next. Uh, at whatever price point, um, it will be something that you could play live and, and it will be incredibly solid and it will be something that you can, you can make a living with. Um, so yes, that is on uh, the horizon. Um, Jacob, can you talk a little bit about what inspired the initial headstock design for the combustions, ABZs, and Z3s? Uh, one of the first things that drew me to the bases besides the sound was that the Dingwall was one of the only companies that knows how to make an awesome looking headstock. Well, thanks, man. Um, you know, that, that headstock design dates back to, I don't know, um, late 80s, maybe early 90s. And it started out on guitar. And uh, uh, at that time, I had a repair shop and, and uh, a 1950s Framus came in. And um, I liked the headstock so much that I traced it. And, um, and then used the side curves uh, on my own headstock. And, and uh, essentially, the headstock was designed around tuner placement. And, and essentially, I want the, the strings to go straight along from the bridge to the nut and to the tuner with, with uh, no sideways bends whatsoever. Um, is that a big deal? Um, probably not. Uh, um, but it's something that I feel strongly about. And, 
other than let's say um, uh, uh, fender saw headstock where in order to have the tuners in line you you have to have the e-string kind of uh, bend a little bit as it leaves the nut um, on all our um, on our design headstocks uh, we try as hard as possible to have those strings go straight to the tuner um, and then man it's it's really tough to do a good looking headstock um, Oftentimes, uh, I'll draw well over 100 headstocks. Uh, I think in the case of the Super, in the, no, in the, in the case of the D-Rock, I think it was closer to 200 headstocks. You know, you change something by 10 thousandths of an inch, and, and you wouldn't think you could notice that. But even from across the room, you can see uh, a line that's altered that much. And, um, and we get into the subtle world of emotions and how does that headstock make you feel. Um, it's not just about the lines and the curves, but it's, you know, what does it stir inside you? And, and that can take a really long time to, uh, to, to work out. So, uh, thank you. I'm glad you appreciate it. Um, one of the other features of our headstocks is they're always as compact as possible. And the reason for that is a, we want it to be able to fit into a case B when you're playing live, you don't want to be smacking into, um, cymbal stands and, and, and other people on stage because your headstock is that much more than you're used to. So um, headstocks are, are uh, one of those dirty techie things that, um, that I think are really, really important. Um, Charles, I would like to know where I can find an NG2 in Canada without paying customs. They're pretty much impossible to find. Um, I would recommend, uh, well, uh, we have several dealers in Canada, but uh, Long and Quaid by far is our largest dealer and um, so I would go there first and I'm pretty sure the Long and McQuaid store locally here in Saskatoon has uh, an NG2 in stock um, if not um, there may be one in the system uh, the Saskatoon store is very active the Markham store is very active uh, they also have some in the warehouse so uh, give your local Long and McQuaid a, um, a shout and if they don't have one in stock which is you know likely in a lot of areas um, that doesn't mean they can't bring one in, although they would likely want you to commit to um, a down payment in order for them to ship it to you. But uh, pretty sure if you try it, you'll like it. It'll go home with you. Uh, Ryan, I agree. Finishes are the hardest part. I make custom guitars and bass parts. Uh, and there are so many factors that go into finish work. Uh, envir environmental factors are a huge consideration as well. Yes, good point, Ryan. Um, uh, it, it's it's a moving target, and I wouldn't want to be a finish manufacturer um, these days because um, a lot of the finishes that we have grown accustomed to were made with pretty toxic materials that um, that have been you know maybe some of the ingredients in those materials have now been uh, banned or have been uh, changed so that they're they're less toxic, and that's a good thing, of course. Uh, but it does make the job of the finish. Um, chemist and uh, the job of the, the finisher and the manufacturer who uses the finish made their job more difficult um, and uh, and so who knows what's going to happen 10 years from now or 20 years from now it's all for a, it's all for a, a good cause we want cleaner air we want cleaner water we want uh, cleaner finishes um, but by the same token, we don't want finishes that are going to fall off guitars because there's an environmental cost to that, too, because you'll have to refinish your guitar. Um, uh, Jean-Marc, dumb question. Do you make lefties? Um, we have left-handed offerings in the combustion and the NG. Um, those are the only ones we offer left-handed. Um, and the reason for that is just because of the, the cost and the complexity in tooling multi-scale. Um, so those are our two, by far, number one sellers, and so we offer them in, in left-handed, but uh, not in anything else. Um, and hopefully you get a chance to try one someday. Uh, Ryan's asking, will the changes to the Hellboy affect the D-Rock? Also, Super J import. Um, <laughs> sorry to beg. That's fine. Uh, uh, the more people ask us for something they would like, the more that helps us figure out what we should be doing. Because uh, we're not in the business of building bases for the Dingwall employees, we're in the business of building bases for you guys, and, and so we want to be able to uh, to know what you want and then figure out how to make it for you. Um, the changes to the Hellboy body will not affect the D-Rock, the five-string D-Rock, um, and uh, as 
we've shown the um, the new body designed to Rob Vanderloo, and he he loves the changes. Um, so they will be distinctly different, but but subtle. I mean, on a dark stage, will anybody notice or, or care? Probably not. But um, uh, as far as uh, Dingwall collectors go, um, it'd be nice to have one of each. Um, Super J. Okay, we'll log that on our on our list of of people that are looking for an import Super J. Um, by the way, love Chicago Lou Malnati's uh, for the win. I'm going to assume that's a restaurant, um, and if it is, I will definitely keep that in mind. Um, and David mentions that his D Rock five string custom headstock is his favorite. Um, thank you very much, David. I appreciate that. Uh, we have a five string here. I'm going to grab one and show it to you. So we do get the question from time to time, what's the difference between a standard and a custom? And the custom is made right here in Canada, and uh, but it looks very similar to the standard, which is made in Asia. Here's one of the differences. Um, so you'll notice that we put a bevel on the edge of the headstock, and it's a little hard to see in this lighting, but we color key um, that bevel to the body finish. And so... Um, it's, you know, we question whether we should do it because it's a lot of work and, and it takes our finisher, Paul Hilliker, a lot of time. But uh, to tell you the truth, it's, it's those little details that, that make things, you know, um, make things worth doing. And, and uh, you know, if we, if we wanted to make the most cost-effective base possible, it would make them like, um, like uh, a rectangle, you know, the, and, um, and, but... Part of the magic is making those little details, those little Easter eggs that, you know, it's just a subtle little detail, and, and um, uh, that to us, that's everything. Uh, that's what we focus on. Uh, glad you like that headstock. Um, yeah, that's, that's one of our favorite headstocks as well. Um, Marco is asking in Brazil. Um, unfortunately, we have no dealers or distributors in Brazil. If you know of a high-quality um, retailer or distributor in Brazil, please have them contact us. Um, because, uh, uh, we do have musicians and artists in Brazil, uh, and Brazil is a wonderful co uh, country and, uh, full of amazing bass players and drummers and, well, musicians in general, but, uh, especially that I've experienced bass players and drummers, man, uh, I don't know how you guys do it down there, but your sense of time and rhythm is just phenomenal. Um, so yeah, we'd love to uh, be able to get our instruments down uh, into Brazil, and uh, what a beautiful country, and uh, if you could help us, please do. Uh, Dennis, how many people are involved in the Dingwall building team? Uh, would be cool to see how you people are working together. Um, we have about a dozen people um, in the shop, and then we have, uh, we have people outside of the shop that, that help in other areas. Um, on the domestic side, it's uh, five people, and then on the combustion side, we have five people as well. Or sorry, four people, um, and then we also have admin and and uh, management and uh, social media. Hi, Felipe. Hello. <laughs> um, so we're actually a very small team, um, but uh, you know, there's uh, there's something to be said about small teams. Um, we had a meeting this morning and everybody could sit in the same room and everybody had an opinion and everybody's opinion was heard. And that's the thing about a small team is that, is that you can have a lot more input to um, what's going on in the company than a large team where it just becomes too many people and too diverse. Um, uh, Armando, um, what are the criteria the judges are going to use for the Dingwall Roof Competition? That's a good question. Uh, Felipe, can we, you we answer will that? We'll post that on Friday. Okay. Um, so Felipe says that we're going to post the criteria on Friday. Um, and um, so right now, I, I won't say this officially because this, uh, this is more Felipe's baby, but I would say criteria is that you play something that, that showcases you as an individual. Um, and be as original as possible. And just take a chance and, and do something that, that you're proud of. Um, Matt, can you see Dingwall collaborating with Dark Glass further to offer spot run or Dingwall specific pedals? Or alternatively, are, they, are there any plans for Dingwall to offer an in-house pedal? Uh, we have no plans for an in-house pedal, although, um, and, I, 
you know, um, I'll hint, but I won't confirm or deny that we are working with dark glass. Um, but I will hint that, um, you know, uh, something could happen. Uh, they're a very cool company. Um, uh, we've been a really good fit for each other for a long time and, and um, really proud to, to, you know, Douglas and Marcos and, and all the, um, all the people over at dark glass, the, uh, they're just like us. They're passionate about what they do and they do a good job. Um, uh, Kieran, uh, has there ever been any thought on producing a one pickup import base? Um, or that kind of option on an AB series. I'm probably in the minority as uh, a one sound is enough player who does not need or use three pickups. The middle pickup solo on my combustion or D-Rock um, are all I ever need. Um, really good point, Kieran. And um, I will hint, but I won't confirm or deny that uh, we are working on a, on a one pickup model or two or three um, or four. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about using just a single pickup is it, it cuts better. Um, and so I'm glad that you're enjoying the middle uh, pickup selection on your, your two bases there. And you probably notice, as I do, it's it's a great tone. And uh, you don't often need a lot of, of pickups. I mean, you've got a great range of tone from here to here, um, just in your own picking style. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think single pickup bases are cool. And hopefully at some point in time we'll have... Uh, an offering. Uh, Ryan, uh, Lou Mal Malnati's is Chicago style pizza. Ah, cool. Yes. Have to try that. Um, it's world famous, but I've never actually had authentic Chicago style pizza. Um, thanks Ryan. Uh, Richard, don't be fooled. The best Chicago pizza is actually in Detroit. Okay. I'm gonna have to go to Detroit now too. Um, matter of fact, Detroit is also on my bucket list. Uh, talk about a city of of history and um, uh, I, I would assume that that the food scene and the art scene in Detroit is exploding. That typically happens whenever you have areas that uh, are affordable to artists and and to people that can you know are willing to take a chance. So um, I, I that would be absolutely a city I'd love to check out soon. Uh, Daniel Jacob Emansky six string signature is my favorite. I plan on buying one. Awesome. Well, Jacob's an awesome guy. He really brought some cool ideas to the table, and uh, we will be working with him on, um, on a model in the near future. Uh, Jan, um, oh gosh, Mr. Dingwall himself. Uh, greetings from Germany. Love your bases. Well, thank you, Jan. Uh, pleasure, and uh, you know what? Uh, Germany is an amazing place. Uh, the first time I visited Germany, it was right after my mother's... Um, uh, death and so I was in a really bad mood and and I arrived in Germany and was overcast and it was like man uh, I, I'm not going to enjoy my time here and what turned me around was the just amazing uh, welcome I had from just everybody that I ran into in, in Frankfurt um, uh, I, I was just blown away at how friendly um, the people were that I met and, and uh, man, I, I love Germany and my kids have been there now and they love it too. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Marco, greetings from Golden, uh, Denver, Colorado Metro. Oh yeah, Golden, Colorado, of course. Um, big fan of Lee Sklar and love the lines of his signature base. Clean and streamlined. I'm five foot two, 64 years old and weight is getting super critical for me. I'm a touring musician currently endorsed by PRS. What is your lightest weight bass and the best uh, for small hands? I play five strings exclusively. Um, you know, I would say, well, obviously, uh, for sure, the, the lightest bass that we make is our ABZ. And um, now on the ABZs and on the Sklars and any, any of the long scale Canadian basses, we add um, a third strap pin right here. And so that works with the Dunlop uh, strap pin system. And what it's designed to do is it's designed, you, you unhook your strap from the normal position and then you plug it in back here and it takes the instrument and it shifts it like this. And so for people that, that um, uh, are maybe a reach is, is difficult for them, either due to a shoulder injury or just aging or, or just the length of your, your, your arm and your fingers, um, just having that bass moved over a little bit makes it much easier to play in these in the first position. Um, so 
I would highly recommend an ABZ uh, for the lightness. Um, I'm going to comment on the the scale length. Now, um, a lot of people hear 37 inch scale and they go, "Oh my God, that sounds so long." Um, but if you if you look at a standard um, stretch and you just move over, it really this is 34 here and this is 37 here. It's not a lot different, and you don't necessarily have to be playing right behind the fret. If your fingers, you know, central in, in the space between the frets, you're, you're still going to be okay. So, as the most important thing to me for uh, if reach and stretch is important to you, is to move the base in this direction, and that will help a lot. Um, and I wouldn't be quite as concerned about the stretch in in the lower positions. Yeah, it's going to be more than the 34, but it's not radically more. Uh, it's more to do with the position and the angle of that you're holding the base at. A more vertical angle is also much easier on your wrist. Um, so I hope you get a chance to try one, and I hope you find out that that uh, the weight and the reach is good for you, because uh, I think you'll really enjoy playing one, especially live. Um, Nick, hope all is well, buddy. Dingwalls are serving me well, as always. Hellboy on the way. Thanks for everything you do and your team as well. Well, thank you, Nick, and I uh, appreciate you mentioning the team. Um, it, my name is on the headstock, but uh, there's no way that I could do all of this by myself. We've got a really talented team uh, behind the scenes that, that are working hard every day, and each one of them is better at their jobs than I ever was. So, so um, it bases that I that I had a hand in the production, they're good, but the bases now are, are better uh, in, a, in every aspect. Um, Tim, nowadays, how long is the wait for a custom-made ABZ? Um, we're still at about the 18-month um, mark. We've been uh, really working hard at trying to shorten that time, and we've taken on more space, and we're, made, we're doing upgrades to the shop. Um, but uh, at, at this point, um, we are still, uh, our lead time is still that long, and um, and uh, hopefully at, at some point in the near future we'll have it below 12 months. Um, we're looking at hiring some new employees to be able to help us do that, um, but uh, until that point we're, we're trying to be as efficient as possible with, with uh, the people that we have. Um, uh, Stefan, uh, how do you measure the nut on the Super J base from end to end or 90 degrees from the neck? Um, that's a good question, Stefan. So how we do it is um, we use the center line. So if it's a four string, it would be the space in between the strings. But if it's a five string, the center line is roughly where the A string is. And then draw a perpendicular there. And then we measure uh, perpendicularly across the neck as it intersects with the nut and the center line or the middle string. Um, there is no official way of measuring the nut width, but that's how we do it, and, and um, that gives you an idea. Um, Richard, got to run to kid stuff. <laughs> uh, happy Father's Day, Richard. Um, thank you uh, for being accessible and doing these types of things for us. Well, I'm glad you took a chance to uh, to sit in and appreciate your questions, and and uh, and I can also appreciate the demands of a father. And good for you for uh, for heading back there and taking care of the kids. Um, uh, Morton, hey Sheldon, uh, good to see you, Morton. Take care. I hope you're uh, doing well. Uh, Morton is our dealer in um, Denmark, and his store is called Base Buddha. Uh, Morton is an amazingly brilliant guy, great bass player, uh, and he has a deep history in, in the bass industry. And uh, so um, it sounds a little bit business um, jargon-y, but we consider all our retailers to be retail partners. Um, and by that, I mean that, you know, uh, we will run ideas past guys like Morton or Mark from Bass Direct. Um, um, and we will ask them for their opinion because uh, we value um, their experience and, um, and we really do look at it as uh, a partnership between us and them and, and uh, they help get our bases into the hands of, of the right customers. Not, they're not right for everybody, but they're right for a lot of people and we want to make sure that we get them into the right hands, not the wrong hands. And so Morton does a great job of that. Um, uh, Jeremy, uh, late to the live, but was 
there any news to report concerning new models? Um, I've hinted a little bit, Jeremy, um, but or, sorry, Jamie, um, uh, and uh, I won't say anything more than we're working on stuff right now, and and uh, it's super cool. We're 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 uh, changing up pickups, we're changing up bridges, we're changing up uh, manufacturing. Um, although they will be, they will still have Dingwall DNA, and they'll still feel and they'll play and they'll sound like a Dingwall, but they will be something new and something. Um, even if you already own a Dingwall base, um, even if you own the most expensive Dingwall base, um, these will be a worthwhile addition to your your collection because they will be different and unique, and and um, uh, and that's a good thing. Um, uh, Eskil, uh, cheers from Denmark, and thanks for taking the time to answer questions. I own a very early model combustion serial number 132 and a newer NG2 model. Uh, they are quite different. Um, yes, very, very, very different, and that 132 came from the very first run of combustions, um, uh, radically different than, than uh, what we're producing now, but also a, a good sounding instrument. Um, uh, can you tell me m about the evolution of the combustion series since its introduction and possible upgrades for future iterations? Okay, so the original combustion, the the truss rod adjustment was at the headstock. Um, the truss rods were made by us here in in uh, Sas well, Saskatchewan, uh, made by our friend uh, Byron Olson, and then shipped to China for installation in the in the bases. The pickups were made here in Saskatoon as well, and they were Alnico II based. Um, and uh, uh, on the initial prototypes, they sounded really good. In production, we found that the B string was a little bit weak, and so we started boosting the B string with neodymium. So it was like a hybrid Alnico neodymium pickup. Um, I, I would imagine that there are no uh, strictly Alnico pickups left anymore because what we did was we offered a a B booster kit so that anybody that had one of the combustions, the early ones, without the uh, neodymium booster, uh, we sent out kits and people could upgrade their own pickups. So that was the first upgrade was to the um, to the pickups. Uh, the early models were volume volume based treble, um, and uh, so the next change that came along was we went uh, we added a rotor switch and a three band preamp. And then we went with neodymium magnets on, on the pickups, and that's the current FD3N. And so those pickups haven't changed, um, I don't know, probably seven years, uh, maybe eight years. Um, the truss rod is now adjustable at the um, heel of the neck, and um, we now include a two-way truss rod. And so from about 2019 on, all the truss rods and combustions and NGs were two-way. And uh, we added carbon fiber spars. Um, the next will feel very different from early uh, uh, combustions to current, and that is strictly uh, well. It's a couple of things actually. Um, the original necks were were hand carved, and uh, we eventually transitioned to CNC carving. So they have the exact same. Uh, they start with the exact same uh, neck model shape that we use on the afterburner mo afterburner models. Um, but they feel differently in the afterburners because of the radius on the fingerboard. And so as time progressed, um, we started to tighten up and make the fingerboard rounder, and that made the neck feel more slender. Even though the neck dimensionally is not slender, it feels slimmer. I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, Ryan, if you've got to bring on one signature artist, alive or past, who would it be? Well, that's a good question. Um, Man, uh, there's there's so many there's so many artists that I'd love to have playing our bases. Uh, being we're from Canada, I'd love to have uh, my one of my personal heroes is Spider from um, he plays with uh, Streetheart and uh, Loverboy, and Spider in Canada um, it was was like Stanley Clark um, or or uh, Mark King from the UK, Stanley Clark from the US, Mark King in the USA. He was like in the 70s, he was so far ahead of all the other bass players that, that he just stood out. And to this day, you listen to his playing, and it doesn't sound dated. It sounds still sounds progressive. It's still very technical and musical at the same time. Um, Getty Lee. Love to have Getty Lee playing our basses. Um, uh, there's tons of guys. 
and uh, so those are just two off the top of my head. Um, Johan, um, as we all know, you're a great friendly guy with a great team. However, were you at any point shy or insecure about the social aspects while trying to get into your industry? Absolutely. Um, and there's a, there's something that I think most creative people have in common, and that is, um, uh, you know, you probably have an overabundance of negative self-talk that makes you devalue your work and your worth um, to society um, more so than if you would have chosen a more um, more clearly laid out path. Uh, and, and um, you know, our society doesn't value the arts uh, as much as they do maths and sciences. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's very easy if you're on the creative side to feel like, man, you just don't, you don't fit into society. And I certainly suffered from that and, and am still working at, at figuring out how to be my best self without being an overbearing jerk and, you know, kind of balance between being a little too overbearing and a little too wallflower. Um, and, and, you know, that's just my internal guidance system. Uh, so yeah, if you're struggling with that, um, I would recommend that, um, here, just try this, just try writing out a page of, of everything that you've done, um, that you've accomplished. doesn't matter how little it is or how, or, or how insignificant or how far back it was. Um, just start with that and just, I bet you, you'll be surprised at how much, um, you've actually accomplished already. Um, it doesn't matter what part of your career in your career you're in. Um, I bet you you would be surprised, and uh, that's a good thing to do, just to just to recognize that your own talent and, and uh, what you contribute to the world. Um, uh, Rulas, I hope I pronounced that uh, properly. Uh, hello, um, I ordered a an NG3 with an estimated arrival on the end of this year. Uh, this new model includes the changes on the pickups and or the same line as before. Um, the base you receive will be as up to date as possible, and so any changes that we've done will be included. Um, we call them rolling changes, and so um, so let's say you ordered a base today, um, and then tomorrow we come up with something new and super cool. We will do a rolling change, and we will introduce it as production goes along. So um, uh, unless it's a last minute change and your base is already built you will have the latest, greatest, most up-to-date, coolest um, base that we can possibly build for you. So rest assured, uh, what you get will be, um, it'll be current. Um, Matt, have you tried noticeably asymmetrical neck profiles? Um, if so, what was your opinion on their playability? Obviously, Strandberg have the Endura neck. Uh, have you tried something similar on Dingwall prototypes? Um, funny you should mention that because I got my start in building guitars um, by building asymmetric necks. Um, that was that was uh, my first innovation, and at the time I thought I, I was the originator of that. And it came from, um, I was a guitar player, and it came from the way I played guitar, and, and I wasn't a thumb behind the neck kind of guy. I was more of a wrap my thumb around. And so, you know, if you look at at that space, um, I'm not really showing it very well, but you would have more, if, if the neck was to perfectly fit that style of play, um, you would shave the treble side of the neck and leave uh, the base side of the neck bulky. And so the very first necks I made were asymmetrical. And um, so I was a big fan of asymmetrical necks for a couple of years until one day I noticed when I was holding the neck, I was sanding a neck, and I happened to be holding it um, upside down and as I was moving back and forth I thought you know it actually feels better the other way and so at that point I went you know what um, it makes the most sense for me to not have it asymmetrical to the base side or to the treble side but just to make it an even curve all the way around so that it fits all styles of, of, um, of playing and this is uh, neither a criticism or a comment on anybody else's necks it's just what I prefer and, and uh, what's worked well for us. Um, another interesting fact about our necks is uh, the shape of the neck was inspired by a skateboard ramp and um, and so I saw an article in Thrasher magazine way back in the 80s and they were describing a, a different style of skateboard ramp and they had the drawings and they had um, the theory behind it and I thought 
you know, that looks like that'd make a cool guitar neck. And so the, the very first neck I tried, that's the shape I used and it felt amazing. So our guitar necks are actually shaped like skateboard ramps to a certain degree. Um, Mimi, how are you Mimi? Um, completely understand and get the idea of negative self-talk. I'm a creative extroverted introvert. Um, yeah, so that's, you got a lot of things. So you can, you can live in both the extroverted world and the introverted world, which I think is cool. Um, I think both are important. Um, and if you can live in both areas, uh, good for you, Mimi. And, um, and I've seen your photographs. You, you're an amazing photographer and, and, uh, I'm not sure what other creative pursuits you have, but, uh, uh, I think that just makes the world a better place. If you can, if you can be creative and add creativity to the world. So good for you, me. Um, uh, Eric, uh, very glad you're healthy. Hey, thank you. Um, passed the one year mark cancer free and, um, uh, I'm happy that I, I passed that milestone. Uh, I got four more years to go before it's, it's fully confirmed, but, uh, I feel confident that, um, that, uh, I'll, I'll be here four years later saying the same thing. Yeah. Passed the four year mark. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, I think we're getting to the end of our questions. Is that right, Felipe? Yeah. So, um, Bingo Brief, we haven't had too many Dingwell entries. So maybe you want to encourage them. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to circle back to the Riff Contest. And so this contest is open to anybody, um, whether they have a Dingwall base or not. Um, but uh, Felipe was mentioning that uh, we could use some more Dingwall players out there uh, sending in their riffs. So uh, don't be shy. Send out um, send out uh, a representation of you playing. Uh, it can be clean. It can be funky. It can be distorted. It can be with a pick. It can be with your fingers. It can be slap style. Um, we're not going to judge on any particular style. Um, it's more about um, how does this showcase you as a unique artist. Um, we want to promote individuality. We want to promote... Um, artistic integrity integrity um so that's that's what we're going to judge on not your technique not on how you play uh so send those entries in you can say goodbye if you want uh and so uh it's been an hour and 16 minutes thanks everybody for hanging out and thanks for your questions really appreciate that uh it's an honor to to have this connection and um i uh, hope to see you again soon take care bye-bye Hey, Sheldon Dingwall here.